Welcome to Abstract Algebra. Today's topic is permutation. Essentially, what that means is we're seeing what functions are like from one set to the same set. Typically, today, we're talking about permutations. So what is a permutation? Well, you probably remember from if you had a combinatorics class don't count on me. I don't remember anything. that if you have three distinguishable objects, like here, a triangle, a circle, and a square, then the number of different ways you can arrange them, number of distinguishable ways you can arrange them, which goes something like this. Is to three. You failed combinatorics. What is it? Isn't it three factorials? Three factorial is two raised to the three, right? Which one is right? Alright, let me just find what's the sixth combination? Oh, I I know what to do. We organize it. Now can you explain uh folks who watch it out there why not? Two raised to three, why three factorials? Well, it's three factorial, which is equal to six. Imagine procedurally choosing it. What would you do? Well, you'd first choose where the circle goes. You'd have three options. Then you choose where the square goes. You've got two options left. And then you're forced to choose where the triangle goes. So why you cannot write two raised to three? Raised to two? What? Well, I'm, three raised to two is completely unrelated. This is the reason... Why there are exactly six possible and options. Why you cannot say two raised to three? Two raised to three is if you had three cells and two options for each cell, which would make things like this possible. But unfortunately, we only have one of each object. It has to be three factorials. Yes. All right. So now. We know what a permutation is, right? Now I know. So we've got six different permutations here. And this is similar to what it means in abstract algebra. Essentially, in abstract algebra, imagine you have a set. And we'll go with a countable set. Like, for example, let's say we have a finite set, x, 1, 2, 3, 4. And of course, as we all know, there are lots of different permutations of this. There's 1, 2, 3, 4. There's 1, 3, 4, 2. There's 1, 4, 3, 2. Uh, I mean, there were six different possible permutations for uh, starting with 1 alone. All in all, there are 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 is 24 possible permutations, right? So, then, all we want to do is we want to create a function it goes from x back to itself. In other words, it takes a variable from x and then converts it to an output that's inside x. Don't get what I mean? Well, let's try an example. Let's say f of 1 is equal to 3, f of 2 is equal to 4, f of 3 is equal to 1, and f of 4 is equal to 2. Now, in this case, Everything is mapping something inside x to another element that is also inside x. So now we're going to be doing something called permutation notation. How do we notate these functions that go from the regular set to a certain permutation of its element? Well, one of the most popular ways is to draw something that kind of looks like a matrix, where you've got the elements of the set on top. So you call this the permutation alpha. And we've got the set elements on the top, and then what they map to on the bottom. Like, for example, our function would be 3, 4, 1, 2. 1 goes to 3, 2 goes to 4, 3 goes to 1, and 4 goes to 2. Pretty simple, right? Now, let's say we want to compose two of these functions. What would that look like? Well, two of these permutations, so to speak. 
Well, B would have to be something on the same set that maps to the same set for them to be uh, composable. So let's say we've got a different one this time, like 3, 1, 4, 2. Then how would we compose them? Well, the composition b dot a of any number would just be beta of alpha of n. So what would that look like? Well, let's try plugging in 1 first. Beta of alpha of 1. Well, what's alpha of 1? 3, right? And then what's beta of 3? 4. So we know beta dot alpha is... We start with 1, 2, 3, 4, and we, we know 1 maps to 4. Then what about beta of alpha of 2? Well, beta of alpha of 2 is just going to 2 to 4, 4 back to 2. So 2 maps to itself. And then what about beta of alpha of 3? Well, 3 maps to 1, 1 maps back to 3, which means this is the identity. And of course, there's nothing left for this to map to but 1. And of course, we can verify that. 4 maps to 2, 2 maps to 1. Great. So this is how you compose. Now, we're going to be taking a look at the inverse, which is just, well, what's the inverse function of A? We can tell that a bijective relation is being made, since everything is 1 and 1 and on to. You don't see any of these outputs or any of these inputs being repeated. So that means that every output has a unique input and every input has a unique output. All right, so how would we write that? Well, the inverse would just be swapping it around. 3, 4, 1, 2 maps back to 1, 2, 3, 4. Remember, we're trying to reverse this. So then, let's say we wanted to sort these into the correct order again. We'd get 1, 2, 3, 4 becomes 3, 4, 1, 2. And surprise, surprise, this function is actually IDO. Listen, it's IDO something. Uh, oh, essentially, what that means is that when you apply it to itself, that gives you the original thing again. Uh, and one last thing, there's also alpha squared, which, as you can guess, is just going to be the original mapping arranged twice, which, as we've just shown, is just going to be the identity. And so it's like we're kind of multiplying these in some sense. Now, this takes a lot of space on the paper or the whiteboard in this case. So what's an easier, more compact notation? Well, we call this the cyclic notation. Now let's take what we had from before. Alpha, one goes to three, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw the start of a cycle. And basically, at some point, we know that these are bound to loop over one another since there's only a finite amount of elements. So we're just waiting until it does loop. So 1 goes to 3, so we write 1 and 3, and then 3 goes back to 1. So we're finished. That's one cycle. And then it should be pretty apparent 2 goes to 4, and 4 goes back to 2. So we have another cycle, and that's how we write alpha. And of course, to keep it compact, we usually write it without the arrows to look like this. And one cool caveat is whenever we have uh, things that map to themselves, like, for example, in the composition of beta and alpha, we get 1 maps to 4, and 4 maps back to 1. So that's a loop complete. And some people would write 2 and 3 in their own loops, since they just map to themselves, but others would just not write them at all, because their lack of presence would to signify that they do hold an identical relationship. Okay. That, uh, okay, I'm messing up my words here. Essentially, uh, the lack of their presence would suggest that they do map to themselves, like the identity. 
Sorry. So that's how we can notate groups. But of course, we're not done just yet. Cyclic groups. And these are groups such that the set that's attached to them contains elements. Hold on, baby. Uh, a few more minutes. Contains elements, like for example, take 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, etc., that are all multiples or powers of one element, depending on what the operation is. So, for example, let's say we have the integers over addition. That's a group, right? So then we know any number in the integers can just be expressed as one added to itself a number of times. So that makes g a cyclic group. Uh, of course, g positive. And another thing you might say, uh, you might uh, that might come to mind are the powers of 2, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, etc. And over multiplication. And you'll notice that this is a cyclic group because every element can be expressed as 2 multiplied by itself a certain number of times. All right. Now, the, uh, both infinite groups either take the form of z or some subset of z, or some modulo of z. Uh, or, when it comes to multiplication, uh, this exponential sort of form. So, that's a cyclic group. And, one last thing we'll talk about are abelian groups. These are just... So now, let's talk about commutativity in groups. Now, you might have noticed that the way we write these is kind of similar to the way we write regular matrices. So let's pivot to how we can actually talk about groups of matrices. So let's, for example, what the hell? Sorry. Let's, for example, talk about the group of all invertible matrices. So matrices is the set of all n by n invertible matrices, which means their determinant is not equal to zero. So, uh, this is actually a group, and of course, the operation we're going to be using is matrix multiplication. So, this, however, is only commutative, meaning the only abelian group of this kind is this, which is literally just scalar multiplication. Anything more, even two by two matrices, and of course, suddenly, matrix multiplication becomes non commutative. So, groups are only abelian when they commute. And one more thing to say is that if A is, if A is abelian and B is abelian, then their Cartesian product, A cross B, is also abelian. So, that's it for today. 